Knitters. Welcome to episode 78 of the Knitty McPurly podcast. I am Devin Bentry. You can find me online at knittymcpurly.com. I am Knitty McPurly over on Instagram, which I have been trying to be better about. Uh, and if you want to email me, I am devin at knittymcpurly.com. It feels like it has been forever since I have seen you guys. Last week I recorded on Thursday because of Good Friday, and then I was out of town for part of this last week. Allergy season is like full-fledged here, um, but I guess it really hasn't been that long. It just feels that way. How about my new mug? Look how cute this is. It's a hand warmer mug. This is actually a little hot to hold it like that, but your hand tucks in there, and then if it's hot, you can go like that or go like that. I got this in North Carolina. It is made by, this came with it. It's the original hand warmer mug created by Bob and Karina Neher, N-E-H-E-R, owners of Clay in Motion Pottery Studio. But I, I highly recommend this mug. I found it, it comes in right-handed and left-handed. And um, I don't know if you can find it online or not. Oh, clayinmotion.com. See that at the very bottom, clayinmotion.com. But this is just the cutest mug. I, I bought it because it was made in the USA. In North Carolina, we did a lot of touristy stuff. And in a lot of those tourist shops, they have mugs that say the name of the place. But if you look under it, it's just made in China. So I was kind of like, oh, that was a bummer. So when I found this, I was I had jumped all over it. They had all different ones. I honestly cannot remember where I got this. It was a general store. I think it was in Waynesville. North Carolina, which I'm going to talk more about that mainly toward the end because the reason I went to North Carolina is to check out our retreat location. And for those of you interested in the retreat, maybe if you want to come in another year or for those of you who have already signed up or for those of you who are on the wait list, I do have a very sizable wait list uh, for this retreat. And if you want to get on it, you can get on it at no cost on my website knittymcpearly.com. Just, you just add the wait list to your cart for $0 and then check out and that puts you on the wait list. And that's, you know, I'm, I will go through that in order of, you know, when you signed up. So I will go through a lot of that, including pictures and all sorts of fun stuff at the end. But for now, we're going to go through a regular podcast because not everybody is interested in that. Um, my favorite part of the trip, should I save all of it? I just had a little bit I was gonna say right now. My favorite part of the trip was a breakfast place that is one mile from where we will be staying for the retreat. It was called the Buttered Biscuit. And I'm not exactly sure what the address would be, whether it be Lake Junaluska or what, but um, it, I, I told the people there, I would move there. I'm gonna put up some pictures while I'm talking about it. I would move there just for that restaurant. The food was amazing. Like, it was just awesome. I wish my dad had been there because it was his kind of place. Like it was full of the same old men every morning and they just went in there and chatted and ate their biscuits and gravy and drank their coffee. And I was like, my dad would love this place. Um, but that's a great place for husbands. If husbands did not get the meal plan to eat with us, then that's a great place for them to go. Anyway, um, we went to Asheville, which was very interesting. It was not my place. Kind of like I've been to Vegas and Vegas is just not my place. I'm just not interested in that type of place. Um, there were a lot of homeless, which is always sad. Um, it's very new agey. There's a lot of shops that had a lot of new agey kind of stuff, which is again, not my thing. Um, but we went to Waynesville, North Carolina, which is a little closer to Lake Junaluska. Asheville's about half an hour. So people who are flying in can fly into Asheville and then it's a pretty quick trip to get there. But um, Waynesville, we loved. We ate there a couple times and I'll, I'll talk more about that at the end, but we really love that. Uh, I know there are some people coming to the retreat from there, which is really nice because there's not a lot of travel time for them. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful area. So there's some video slideshows and I'm gonna talk more about that at the end. For now, progress and shop news. We went to this diner, the one I just talked about, and they just keep refilling your coffee. That's like the way to my heart. Just keep coming and filling my coffee cup. I'm a cheap date. <laughs> I really am. Like, just give me more coffee and more coffee and I'm happy. 
Uh, anyway, the Leitere shawl is live. This is the shawl that was the mystery knit along for Lent. Um, the yarn is no longer available. That was only available for people who got the Lent calendar, but it is a great pattern to use scraps. I have a bunch of patterns that are great for scraps in my shop. I have the Timothy Ridge, the Pine Grove Ridge, um, and this one, and the Noah shawl. These are all great for small quantities of different colors that you want to kind of put together and make into a shawl. Um, it's very simple to work. It has garter stitch and some interesting lace. I really like this lace because it is asymmetrical, which means it does not mirror. So as you're working it, you're going to have a different number. You're gonna have, it's gonna be different on each side of that middle stitch marker. Um, I like that personally, but I also have ones that do mirror. I like that too. That's, I don't know, it's all good. Uh, if you wanna pick that pattern up, you can get that from my website. Also, I finished my everywhere sweater, the one that I showed last week. I believe last week, did it have one sleeve maybe? I can't quite remember what I showed last week, but it is currently blocking. It's downstairs with you know the wires and the pins just to get the shape that I want with the fan on it. Finished that on my trip. And so I finished it and I immediately wove in the ends, sewed down the pockets, and I was gonna leave a good bit before blocking because this is kind of a new idea for me of leaving a longer tail before the blocking so that it can kind of you know, suck back into the knitting as needed. Um, this is one of those things that I think some people really like. I get the idea, but if you've woven it in enough, then whether it sucks back in, if there's some stuck out or it's just woven in enough, you're gonna have enough. I don't know. So I just kind of wove it in a little extra and snipped it because I wanted to wear the sweater. And I did, I wore it. I wanna say I finished it the first day we were there and I wore it the whole second day. Because when you travel in April, you don't know what the weather's gonna be like. I basically underpacked in terms of weather appropriate clothing. So I did have a coat, and I, but I wanted to wear my new sweater. So I wore that a lot. I love this sweater. It is awesome. The saddest part is that I have finished it right as it's kind of getting too warm to wear it. It is a warm sweater. My mom mentioned when she saw me put it on on the podcast where it didn't have any sleeves, she's like, I want that. I want it just be done with it right there and I want to wear it like a vest. And that would be great too. That would be, you could probably wear something like that through more seasons. But I'm going to get the buttons sewn up on that and get that pattern written into the tech editor so that that can go out to be tested. Um, my Hepburn sweater is currently with the tech editor. I told her I was out of town so I haven't really heard from her, but she has it. And the test knit starts on Friday, I think. Is Friday May 1st? Whenever May 1st is, that's when the, the test net starts. Also, I'm going to have some yarn up for the Hepburn sweater, mostly for the testers, um, but if you are planning ahead or if you just want a sweater quantity of fingering weight yarn, there will be enough for everybody. Let me just go through. Um, I'm just gonna show the colors right now because as we get into our topic and word of the week, I wanna talk a little bit more about that, but I have a couple colors. Um, this is like a light rose gold. I like just wound these up. This is where they are. I didn't even tuck in the ends and make them pretty, but this is gorgeous. This color is just, oh my gosh. It's similar to my rose gold, but this is a lighter version and I just love it. So I have sweater, I will have, I don't have them in yet. Um, probably Sunday, probably tomorrow, I will have sweater quantities of the uh, Fort Lauderdale fingering weight yarn, which is great for anything you want to use a sock weight fingering weight yarn for um, in the shop in the light rose gold. Um, I have a couple other colors. Also, this is a color. Do I, I don't think I have a name for this color yet, but it is a light gray that leans warm. It's gorgeous. It's just stunning. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. You can see these are like, um, what's the word? Not variegated, but um, what's the word that means not variegated, but they're, they're like tonal, they're tonal. So they very much are look hand dyed. They're not solids. Um, I think I would just, I like, I like the tonal. I think that, I 
sums up pretty much how these will knit up. But we have this light rose gold, this warmish taupey gray that I have not named yet. Um, a lot of these colors I got the idea for when I was working out my Le Terry shawl. You might recognize some of them. Um, dyeing up mini skeins is a great way to come up with new colors. And then I have this color, which I believe I called ochre, as it is similar to oh, that. Oh my gosh. Oh, the giveaway. I drew a winner too. I'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, this color is called ochre. Um, I love them together. How gorgeous would that be together? Like a color work sweater? Oh. Anyway, okay. Uh, I also have this color, which, oh my gosh, I love these colors so much. Let me put them all together so you can see them. Some of them I can't, oh, I can't remember if I've named them or not. I think I called this one Meadow. Oh, it's so gorgeous. I have always loved this green, but um, it kind of fell out of fashion for a little while, but it is back now and I just love it. I'm actually working on... Do I want to talk about this now? I hate when I, oops, that's my daughter. Hold on. Okay. I got to pick her up at two. What time is it now? I have time. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, I always get ahead of myself where I want to talk about something a little ahead of where I have it. Please forgive me. And I know you guys do. Like 99% of you are like, Devin's a homeschool mom. She can only throw together as much as she can throw together. And whatever we end up with is us hanging out and knitting and talking about knitting. And that's fun. There's a very, very tiny percentage of people who are like, why don't you know everything there is to know about this topic before you put it on the internet? Disclaimer, I do not know everything there is to know about any topic, but I'm just doing the best that I can. So that's where we are with that. I was not originally planning to knit a crew neck version of my Hepburn sweater because I thought, I just don't know if I have time. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I really want this in my wardrobe. So I have decided to do that. It's not very exciting. And right now, as this sweater isn't, it's kind of boring on the needles. Right now it's on a 16 inch that it's just about outgrown. But this is the same color, the meadow color on the silk. And you can see that it takes it a little bit different, differently. So this is a 7525 Merino nylon, and this is 100% silk. Both are animal fibers and are dyed in the same manner. But you can see, and this one even, I like, I like how this one even has a little bit of white in it. I think that's the only place. We're going with it. It's a hand dye. So, but this is for my sweater. We're going to see how that knits up. I think it's going to look like the light is hitting it. I think it's going to look good. I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, so this is the silk and our word of the week is silk. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. Now, one thing I noticed about this fiber, I've never worked with 100% silk before. It reminds me a lot of knitting with a bamboo or a tencel both of which are plant fibers. So, but this does not, it's not like knitting with wool at all. It's very different. It, it, if you've ever knit with bamboo or tencel, that's what it feels like. Um, tencel, I had to look it up because I wasn't exactly sure. I knew tencel was a plant fiber, but I looked it up and it is a cellulosic fiber obtained from wood pulp using recyclable solvents. And it's interesting to me that that fiber is similar to silk, which is made, which is spun from a worm. Interesting. I, I also looked up bamboo as a fiber, and here is what I found. Bamboo textile is any cloth or yarn made from bamboo fibers. While historically used only for structural elements, like as a wood, um, or as a textile, it was used like in a corset, like used as a structural element, even in a, in a garment. In recent years, different technologies have been developed that allow bamboo fiber to be used for textiles and fashion applications. Um, modern clothing labeled 
being made from bamboo is usually a, viscos, a viscose rayon, which is a fiber made by dissolving the cellulose in the bamboo and um, using the fiber that is left. So bamboo is an alternative to plastic that is renewable and can be replenished quickly because bamboo grows really fast. I'm talking about bamboo, even though this yarn is silk because it really is so similar. And I was curious about it. And thinking about bamboo and, and what it is, you know, like we were looking at replacing our floors upstairs and we were looking at bamboo flooring. And that's interesting because if you dissolve the cellulose in the bamboo, you're left with fibers that can be spun into yarn. Um, bamboo flooring, interestingly enough, is super hard. And had we known that back in the day when we did our downstairs flooring, we probably would have used that because our hardwood has a lot of dents in it. So anyway, <clears throat> so that is bamboo. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead into my topic of the week, which is silk, <clears throat> because that is the fiber that we're talking about right now. So the word silk, from the English, comes from about 1300. It comes from the Old English, siolok, S-I-O-L-O-C, which means silk or silken cloth, from the Latin, sericum, meaning silk, or silken garments. Um, and all of this traces back to the Greek, sericos, meaning silken or pertaining to seres. Uh, the Ceres were a group of people in Asia from whom the Greeks got silk. Okay, whatever. So Western cultivation began about 552 um, AD. They said CE, but I don't like that. I like AD. Year of our Lord, 552, when agents from Byzantium impersonating monks smuggled silkworms and mulberry leaves out of China. <gasps> We gotta make it exciting. So basically, silk originally comes from China, and we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. This is also found, the word silk is also found in Old Norse as silky, S-I-L-K-I, um, and it talks about the Germanic and how it basically moves around, and it describes like in the 14th century talking about the hair on corn, how that's like a silk because it's silk. Basically, this all comes back to the group of people in Asia called Ceres, from which the Greeks got their silk. That's what they called them, and so that's how silk became silk. Silk comes from China and the Far East, basically. Okay, all right. So, that got me thinking about my silk that I have it's not in my shop yet, but it is currently being worked up by me to go in the shop. And I thought, where does this come from? Because I do get a lot of questions from people. Where does your yarn come from? I don't have sheep. There are no merinos in my backyard. I buy my bases and then I dye them in the way that I like and resell them. So where do they come from? All of my wool comes from South America either Peru or Argentina or Uruguay. So that is where the wool comes from. That is where the mills that spill, spin the wool are. And then those are shipped here to my supplier and it's just a chain of events, right? But I got to thinking about the silk and that other base I showed you before, I have a yak silk base thinking, hmm, where does that come from? So I messaged my supplier and I said, where does the silk and the yak come from? And his response was, it is spun in Peru. And I said, okay, but where does it come from? <laughs> Thank you for telling me where it's spun. It's spun in Peru. That's good information. But where do the fibers come from? So it took two emails to get this answer. And his response was, it comes from China. It is purchased through a Swiss broker which ensures that it is of the highest quality. Now, highest quality is one of those terms that can mean many things. Does that mean that the Swiss broker verifies that there's no slave labor that goes into it? Maybe, I don't know. Does that mean that it's from the highest quality silkworms? 
I mean, to me, China through Switzerland, through Peru to the United States just feels like laundering. And I mean no criticism or critique of my supplier because he did give me that information even though it took two emails. Um, so I thought, where does the world silk come from? So all of this is leading me through this, down this rabbit hole of where did my silk come from? Where does silk come from? It originally came from China, but things can move. You know, we just read that monks, people dressed as monks can smuggle silkworms and mulberry leaves, like that can happen. So when you see mulberry silk, that is when the silkworms eat the mulberry leaves. It's like clover honey. That's what the bees ate. The bees were, they're not eating, but that's what they were, you know, sticking their little fuzzy bee bodies on. That's is clover, the clover flowers. So that's what mulberry silk is. So I thought, okay, I, I go searching the internet for this. Where does silk come from? And I find out that what makes the most sense to me is that China is the largest producer and exporter of silk in the world. It makes six times more than the next country, which is India. So the, the tremendous bulk of silk in the market comes from China. So silk is not really regulated in the same way that other textile fibers are. It's not watched in the same way. And that's because it only makes up a quarter of a percent of the yearly textile production. It is a luxury fiber and it does not have the kind of eyes on it that other fibers do because there's just not that much of it. It's a very, very small portion of the textile industry on a yearly basis. So basically, there are other countries you can get silk. India is the next one. I looked it up, it's like Vietnam, Uzbekistan. There are other places that are kind of around Japan that are kind of near to China that produce silk. And I imagine fair trade silk can be acquired. I'm not exactly sure how to do that. Um, at this point, I have a small amount, not a huge amount of silk that I really can't account for. I have a feeling about it. Like it, it brings me this feeling that I have when I buy clothes from Amazon. It's that feeling of, I don't know where this came from. I don't know who made this and I don't know under what conditions. And I'm going to say a prayer for that person. And that is what I can do from here. But that said, other than what I have already purchased, I just have an icky feeling about this and I don't really want it in my shop. So I will be selling the small amount that I have um, and I will be on the lookout for something that is more fair trade. Also, I'm always open to made in the USA yarn, milled in the USA yarn. If anybody has a tip on any of that stuff, let me know because I am open to that. Um, I do my best as a business owner to know where things come from and to basically avoid any slave labor. Slavery is one of the worst things in the history of humanity, one of. There are several really horrible things, but slavery is right up there and I just don't wanna participate in it. And I think that by acquiring anything from China, we just can't say with any certainty that there was no slave labor involved in that. So I don't want any of that in my shop, basically. It's a process, it's a learning process. Sometimes I buy things and it's not until after that I say, wait a minute, just because my supplier says that almost everything in their shop comes from XYZ, it doesn't mean that everything does. And sometimes you have to ask, you have to say, wait a minute, this particular thing that I bought, where does that come from? Um, so I hope that communicates everything I need to communicate about that. I will have it in my shop in the sense that I already bought it and it's not a lot, it's only a little bit. Um, and you can buy it if you want, totally up to you. But basically, if you're buying something made of silk, the probability that that originated in China is high, unless it specifically says, and even if it says made in, 
that doesn't mean that that's where the fibers came from. And, you know, use this information however you want. You, you can't always know. You can't always get that information. It is really, really difficult. So anyway, moving right along. That's my hand wringing word of the week for this week. Moving right along is the topic of the week, which is short rows. Basically, uh, one thing that I wanted to say about the silk, which made me say that it's similar to Tencel and bamboo, is that it has amazing stitch definition. Like it's got a sheen just like bamboo and Tencel does. Oops, pulling stitches off the needle as I stretch it out but it also has tremendous stitch definition. So the good thing about that is that you can see the stitches really well and that is desirable. The bad thing about that is that if you make any kind of a mistake, it's just glaring at you and there's already a couple of mistakes in there. So I wanted to talk, it got me thinking about short rows. Right now, I have a couple short rows in the back of the neck. The Hepburn sweater does have that. I think it has um, six. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six short rows. And what that does is it extends the back of the neck right here and it causes this to drop down a little so that it's not you know, strangling you. Basically just makes the neckline lay really well, right? lay really nicely. There are seven different kinds of short rows. In my patterns, I tend to always use the wrap and turn because everybody knows those. They're very common. They're pretty easy to work. Um, most people don't need to look them up because they use them a lot. However, there are seven different kinds. And what you can take from that is, there are seven different kinds of short rows. You need to know every single one, when to use what, and just be an expert on the short rows. Or, you can recognize what I think about this, this is kind of my take on it, is <clears throat> there are seven different ways to go back and forth without completing a row. That's what a short row is, by the way, in case you're going, what the heck is a short row? A short row is when instead of working all the way across your knitting or in the round of just continuing to go around, is where you stop one row and then you turn around and go back and turn around and go back and what you get is more knitting in one spot. And that's what we're doing here in the back of the neck. So the question is, how do I turn? And I personally feel that I don't really care if that shows as long as it looks neat and uniform and symmetrical. Like if, if I'm left with a, with a beautiful little set of three holes there in a way that looks really nice, I don't really care. But when I've been working my Hepburn sweater with these, this yarn with this incredible stitch definition, what I have is I did the wrap and turn short row and I did not pick up the wraps because I thought, let's see what happens. You know, let's just try this out. And what I'm left with, if you don't pick up the wraps, is you end up with three little holes when working on the right side. But when working on the wrong side, I'm left without picking up the wraps, I'm left with these kind of annoyingly messy stitches. So that made me say, I need to know more about these other kinds of short rows because you're turning on the right side and then you're turning on the wrong side and then you're turning on the right side. So these are going to be different if you're working in stockinette stitch. Now, if you're working in garter stitch, that's something else. But I'm going to very quickly go through the seven different kinds of short rows and I will be linking videos below that show you how to work these particularly if you are interested. The first me method is called a simple short row. Basically, you work to the turning point, turn your work, slip the first stitch and tighten to avoid a hole and keep going. And then you work back the other way, turn your work, slip this first stitch, tighten it, and keep going. These are very simple. I've never done them, but frankly, I'm interested. Like that sounds amazing. It sounds super simple. Sounds more simple than wrap and turn, which frankly I use a lot because everybody knows them, like I said, but I don't know. I think I'm falling out of love with the wrap and turn. Number two is the wrap and turn, which is the most common. 
But the problem with these is that they look different on each side. And the reason that I chose not to pick up, uh, pick up the wraps is because I don't like the way that looks. Maybe there are other magical knitters who can pick up these wraps and make them look amazing. But frankly, whenever I pick up the wraps, they don't look that great. I follow the, the directions. Like I know how to do it. I get what we're doing in the wrap picking up. I'm just not happy with the product. I'm not happy with how it looks. So the third method is the yarn over method. This is a variation of the wrap and turn, but instead of wrapping, you work a backwards yarn over and then work those together on the return row, just like picking up the wraps in method two. So the fourth method is Japanese short rows. This method is slightly complicated. It involves slipping the first stitch, putting a lockable stitch marker around your working yarn, and then on the return row, you're going to pull it out and work and you're going to pick up the wraps just like you did in the wrap and turn. It's a little bit complicated. Again, I'm not, this is not meant to be a tutorial on it, just meant to get you to understand that there are different ways of doing it. Feel free to click the link below if you want the detailed directions. The fifth meth method is called Sunday Short Rows, named for Carol Sunday, who came up with it. And basically, I think she just wanted to make a name for herself because these are not that different from Japanese short rows. Um, it's the same, except that you don't slip the first stitch. The sixth method is called German short rows. I really like this one. It is super easy and nearly invisible. It's very simple because basically what you're doing is turning a stitch upside down. And when you do that, you get two legs of the stitch and you just knit those together and it's super easy. The seventh one is called Shadow Wraps, which is very similar to the German, but a little harder to execute. It involves lifting and knitting them together on the return. So the lesson here is there are many different ways to do short rows. Feel free to look into them and decide which one that you want to, which one that you want to do. There you go. There's our topic of the week. All right, on to knitting fantasies. This week, I wanted to talk about patterns that are great for summer. Are you a summer knitter? Do you knit summer garments or do you just use the summertime to knit up more fall garments? In the past, I have been entirely a fall, winter, cold weather knitter. Um, I do have a couple short sleeved sweaters that can be used during kind of the transition seasons. But one thing that I do not own that I would really like to own is a swim cover-up. So I am going to be linking to intheloopknitting.com 19 beach ready knitting patterns. Um, most of these are free. They are linked below and you can click on them and go find them. Um, the one at the end is my favorite. It is called the Alana beach cover up or something like that, but it's a, the name Alana. And if you click on the, their link, you actually can't get to it. But if you Google Alana beach cover up, you can find it on Ravelry and it is part of a paid ebook. So you can get that if you want. Um, but I really like these. There's a lot of different ones in here. There's a lot of variety. Some of them look like they might be hard to keep on your body. Like the one that has the big opening in the back. But I love the idea of making these in like a cotton yarn. Um, I think that would be really fun for summer. So today's Knitting Fantasies is brought to you by the beach and the pool. I don't think uh, we're going to be headed to the beach this summer, but my sister-in-law is one of those people who has a yard with everything, including a pool. So we spend a lot of time over there in the summer and uh, that's really fun. I spend a lot of my summer in a bathing suit and a beach cover up. So I may need to make one of these this summer. Okay, moving right along to, so here's what happened. A couple weeks ago, I did not have a so here's what happened. And that brought on a flurry of you guys sending me your stories, which has been so, so amazing. Um, I have kind of lost track of who I said was going when, so I'm just going to gather them up and do them one at a time. If you sent me a story, please tune in and see if it's yours up this week. Um, but I got a letter from Sarah 
a podcast watcher, she wrote me a letter, like an actual letter. And she typed out her story. I didn't even have to print it out. Thank you so much, Sarah, for doing that. It was so sweet. I was like, oh my gosh, actual mail. It was so nice. I loved it. Snail mail. So here is what she says. She says, here is the story of my knitting life. It's really not much of a story, but a journey. My mother was a knitter and I remember holding the yarn between my arms so that she could wind it into a ball. She always had something on her needles, which inspired me to want to learn how to knit. One problem we had to solve. She was right-handed and I was left-handed. We tried the do it as I do only backwards method, but that didn't work. We tried sitting opposite each other, but that didn't work. Her friend was also left-handed, and as a last resort, I tried to take a few lessons from her that were barely successful. Of course, this was back in the 60s with no YouTube, and we lived in Western Iowa, which was not close to any knit stores for a private lesson. I was probably in third grade. Since I only learned a few things, my yarn sample quickly became a ball of yarn barf. <laughs> That's funny, my son is also left-handed, and we have found that whenever he is learning something, he just does it right-handed. Like um, when he bats for baseball, he bats right-handed. When he, uh, we got him a left-handed catcher's mitt, but he can catch with either, either hand. He plays guitar right-handed. I don't know, that's interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, Sarah says, fast forward 20 years. I tried it again with my mom trying to teach me. So this must be the 80s, I'm thinking. I don't know where she got her patience, but I am grateful for it. This time it clicked and I could knit left-handed taught by my right-handed mother. I knit a few scarves, but by that time I was married and had young children, so the knitting went into timeout. I picked it up again a few years later, and by this time I lived close to a city where I could go ask questions and learn how to start a sock. Notice that I say, start a sock. <laughs> totally get it. I had some questions when it came to my first heel turn. The instructor looked at me knitting left-handed and said she was sorry, but she couldn't help me. Knitting time out again. I still loved yarn and happened to be in another yarn store and was telling the owner of my left-handed predicament. I just couldn't find people to help me when I had questions. She told me to learn to knit right-handed, just like my son. Both hands are actually doing different things, so it would not matter or be beneficial to knit with my predominant hand. Well, by this time, my kids were out of high school and off to college. My mother came to visit and we sat down again and she taught me how to knit right-handed. Success. I haven't stopped since and because of my mother's patience, my determination and our love of yarn, we persevered. I told my mom how many times I was so grateful that she did not give up on me. She has since passed away and I am knitting sweaters, socks, scarves, blankets, and all the good knitty things. She would be so proud of me as I am of her sharing her knitting passion with me. Now my three-year-old granddaughter sits beside me and tries to knit uh, as she has also caught the urge to learn. That is pretty good, three years old. I hope she will remain excited about it until she can actually do a stitch. The knitting enthusiasm has continued through so many generations and cultures. It is what keeps us content and our hands busy. And I love being a part of the knitting community. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's such a great story. I love hearing stuff like that, where these things get passed down. Um, my kids, Gigi's really the only one who currently knits. Alexis is my oldest. She can knit, but she chooses not to. Um, I have not taught Charlotte yet. And actually I had a suggestion to teach her on the podcast. So we're thinking maybe next week we will do that. Uh, this week I ended up with just too many other things and I'm gonna be talking about my trip and showing you those slideshows too. So, um, but Charlotte is seven and that is a great age to learn how to knit between Seven is actually a little bit young. I think the ideal age for learning how to knit is probably about 10. And it depends if they're boys or girls too, because I don't know, I kind of feel like my boy 
was quicker at physical things than my girls. Like he could ride a bike without training wheels at four, whereas my girls were more like seven or eight before they could do that. Although Charlotte was six, so I don't know, maybe six or seven they were. But in terms of maturity and other things, the girls kind of blew right past their brother. So I don't know. I guess it probably varies. But this summer, I'm going to be going to stay at, at my sister-in-law's house because she and her husband are going to go out of town and they have the house with everything. So we're going to hang out at their house. And some of the girls, my um, nieces and my niece's cousins, uh, want to learn how to knit. So we're going to be doing that. And that would be a really fun thing to catch on video. I don't think they would mind. I'll have to ask them if they mind if I put that on, on the podcast. But um, yeah, teaching kids how to knit and just passing that down is great. I love that. And some people are going are gonna to love it and some people are going to be like, I can do it, but it's just not my thing. So it's good to pass down either way. Thank you so much, Sarah. If you have a knitting story, feel free to join the queue. I have five or six now that are queued up, so I'm good for a while. But if you send me one, I will queue it up and include it in a future podcast. Um, my giveaway winner. I put the number of comments into the random number generator, as I always do. And the winner is of this giveaway of the awesome... Devin Scissors and uh, Jennifer Young Cool Leather Scissor Holder is Janet J. Roberson from Mounds, Illinois. Janet, you're my winner. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, I'll get in touch with you and I will get this mailed off to you. You are so, so lucky. I know a lot of people wanted this giveaway because it is just so awesome. Uh, if you missed out on these, they will be in my shop again sometime soon. And that is super exciting. Yay. Congratulations, Janet. Um, okay. The last segment is about my trip to North Carolina. If you have an interest in North Carolina or the knitting retreat, or if you're coming to the retreat, this is the part where I'm going to be talking about all of that. You guys, we lucked out by getting the Lambeth Inn at Lake Junaluska. So Lake Junaluska basically is a man-made lake that was, I was talking to the ladies there and I was like thinking about the Vanderbilts and the Biltmore, which is about 20 minutes away. And I wanna talk about that because we went and saw that too. And just thinking about the amazing stuff that these crazy rich people did in the late 1890s in, uh, around Asheville. And I was like, how did the Christians get this amazing spot? Like, how did that happen? If, you know, the Vanderbilts were here, why didn't they scoop this up? And they said, well, it's the Christians who made the lake. So before the lake was there, it was just another one of the beautiful mountainous places in Western North Carolina. But when the lake came, all of these different like um, places came around it many of which are owned by, I actually don't know if they're still owned by the Methodist Church. They were started by the Methodist Church as kind of a, a place for people to come and be ministered to. So there's a lot of Christian stuff around there. and um, But there's a lot of other vacation homes there too. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot there. Um, but this Lambeth Inn where we're gonna be staying is amazing. It was recently redone. I have a video compilation, like a slideshow of pictures and video that I took while I was there. Um, the first thing I wanna show is my compilation of stuff from the area, which is basically the lake. We took a nice long walk around the lake and just local places that are nearby. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that first. Here's that.
Okay, I also want to show you my kind of walking tour through the Lambeth Inn. Couple things, make a mental note. I will be putting this out to those of you coming to the retreat also on our Google group, but you can just make a mental note for now. There is no conditioner in the rooms. Ever since my hair grew back, I have like different hair. Like I used to have very fine hair and what has grown back is very different. And so I, I really kind of only use conditioner on my hair. I don't really ever wash it with shampoo. I wash it with conditioner. So that was, I don't have very good hair in most of these pictures. And even now, like I'm still, I'm coming back off of it. It's, it's my, it kind of messed with my hair <laughs> because I figured I don't need to bring shampoo and conditioner because it's a hotel. Like they'll have that there. They had conditioning shampoo, but no conditioner. They only had bars of soap, no liquid soap. There is a hair dryer in the room though, so you don't need to bring a hair dryer. They had moist towelettes for makeup removal, so that was nice. Um, but if you are a conditioner or body wash using person, bring that because they don't have that in the rooms. There is a refrigerator in the room. Um, in the video I'm about to show, I kind of go through the room and show all of the things. Um, it looks like the refrigerator is stocked, but that's after I put my fizzy water in there. So the refrigerator is empty when you get there and you have to turn it on, but you can stock it up with whatever drinks or food or whatever you want to put in there. Uh, I had a voiceover on the video, but I liked it with just the music. So you can kind of, you know, gather what you need to see from the video. Um, also, there are several elevators in the hotel, but I do prefer to take the stairs. So that's why I showed the stairs. I think the stairs are so cute. They're like your, your middle school stairs. <laughs> they're just, they're just old fashioned. Like they're the original stairs. They have redone so much of the hotel, but the stairs look to be original back from 1922 when this hotel was built. Um, we had to take the stairs to burn off of the biscuits and gravy, and I'm sure that didn't do it. <laughs> but we also took a walk around the hotel, which you just saw in the last slideshow. My feet were killing me because I did not bring shoes that were sufficiently comfortable. So bring like your most comfortable walking shoes if you intend to walk around the hotel. Even though it's January, you know, sometimes we get 50 degree days in January, and you might want to bundle up to go take that walk, but it is beautiful. I think it's about four miles if you go all the way around the lake, but there are two bridges which kind of cut that walk short. And I wanna say that makes it more like two miles, which is what we did. I, I think we did about three, two or three miles. I'm not sure. Um, wear comfy shoes. The beds and the pillows were crazy comfortable, like awesome. We loved them. My husband and I slept like logs. Um, so anyway, here is the video from Lake Junaleska. It shows kind of my walking tour and also just some pictures. Here's that.
Okay, the next little compilation I wanna show you is our trip to the Biltmore. If you intend to go see the Biltmore more than once in a year, I think it is worth it to buy the annual pass. It's like 200 bucks a person. It's expensive, but just to go see the Biltmore in a very basic way, like the cheapest ticket you can get is $86 a person. So my husband and I really thought about this. We were like, do we want to go see this amazing piece of history at, you know, $190 for both of us to go? And we decided that we were going to do it. This was going to be our big splurge of this trip. And so we bought our tickets online. You should buy your tickets ahead of time if you're interested in doing that. Biltmore is open all year. So you can go and see it um, even when in January while we're there if you want to do that. We walked through the house and we walked through the gardens and it was a beautiful day. Again, my feet were killing me. We could have walked more, but by this point I had like five blisters that I was working on. So, you know, we were there for maybe two or three hours. The house was amazing. It was state of the art for its time. It began to be built in 1890 and it was completed, not completely complete, but it was opened December 24th, Christmas Eve of 1895. And it was just amazing. Indoor bowling alley, indoor swimming pool at a time where people did not swimming pools. This was not a thing. It's not like there were swimming pools at the time. This was unique. And because of that, so when you see the picture of the swimming pool, it has no water in it. You can't fill it up anymore because it leaks. But you'll see that it has a slope and I don't think you can see from the picture, I might have a picture of it, but there are ropes along the edge for people who couldn't swim. But it was thought to be like therapeutic to get in the water and, and you know, be in the water. So it was just amazing. There's refrigeration, there was electricity, electricity ran through the whole place. I mean, it, it, was, it was just amazing. If you have any interest in that, I highly recommend that tour. You would need a car to get there. Um, but you could rent a car if you wanted, or I think there, there might be enough local people. Maybe we could get a group to see who would want to go and we could carpool. Um, but anyway, here is the Biltmore.
And last, but definitely not least, I did not make a slideshow. I'm just gonna put up a couple pictures while I'm talking right now, is we went to Mount Airy on our way home. Now at this point, because the trees are blooming more down in North Carolina than they are up here where we live in Northern Virginia, like we're just further north, my husband's allergies were so bad and my feet were hurting. So we didn't spend too, too much time in Mount Airy, but um, I loved it. Like they have embraced being Mayberry. Uh, this is the town where Andy Griffith was from. You can go see his house. We didn't because my husband wasn't feeling well. Um, there's a museum there. Again, we didn't go see that, but we did walk through the old town and I took pictures of a lot of things as you're seeing right now that they really have embraced this. Like this is their tourist thing. So even like their, they'll have stores that are called, you know, um, Mayberry Auto Parts or whatever. Like they've really embraced that. My favorite thing there was this antique store that had these, it just had a ton of stuff. I love a good antique store. My favorite things to buy there are old Anchor Hawking Fire King glassware or Pyrex, vintage Pyrex. I love that stuff. So I bought these little custard cups. I don't have them up here, but they're just these milk glass little custard cups because my kids are always eating small amounts of things. And so those are nice for like little snack bowls. Or if you wanted to serve like a dipping sauce on the side of something, we're always looking for little cups like that. So I bought those and I got my son a pineapple grenade. That's not up here either, but it's, um, it's either a dummy grenade or a replica or whatever, but we learned about these. It's so funny. So I go up to the checkout and I've got my, a grenade and some custard cups. <laughs> the lady was like, this is an interesting choice, <laughs> but my son loves the grenade. He has been pulling the pin and throwing it everywhere. <laughs> We'd all be dead a thousand times over if that thing was alive. But uh, it was a lot of fun. I could have looked there forever, but my husband was like, we're leaving, we're done. He was ready to get home. Um, so anyway, it was a great trip. Thank you for watching this far. Thank you for enjoying all of my vacation pictures. If you're coming to the retreat in January, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, this place is so great. I honestly feel like, we could do this like every two years. Like, I think that would be amazing. If there's interest and you guys want to come every couple of years, we can totally do that. I'm, I'm in, especially if I have helpers. I already have lots of people who volunteered to help. Um, this retreat is entirely run by volunteers, including myself. So be kind. Uh, I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be just so awesome because we're just there to hang out together and knit and talk about what we know and share our love of the craft and do a little shopping in the marketplace, which we're going to have a whole room for. It's gonna be awesome. So anyway, until next time, thanks for watching. Bye guys. Hi knitters, welcome to episode 78 of the Knitty McPurly podcast. I am Devin Ventry, you can find me online. What is that? Good grief. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> Let's try that again. Okay, I Charlotte, ready to bloop. Perfect. You have shown this before. We've no, shown. I haven't. Yes, you have. Have you seen this sheet before? Isn't he cute? I like his little striped legs. I mean, it's knitting. It's a sheep. yarn sheep. It's What's the sheep? difference? <laughs> How are you today, Charlotte? You have a Hello Kitty on your shirt. Uh. Nah. His name is Donkey. All right. This He's podcast. <laughs> you named him Donkey? Yeah. This podcast is already going to be a little bit long, so can we cut our blooper short and say goodbye? Um, bye. Keep...